Boxing is a gentleman's sport where humility and respect towards the fighting ring and its participants should never be lacking even in the most legendary champion in the history of the discipline. However, over time we have witnessed those boxers whose best weapon is their tongue boasting about skills they do not back up with actions once they enter the ring. Fortunately, every arrogant boxer eventually receives their lesson and many of them have had to learn about the values of boxing from the hard fists of Mike Tyson. Welcome, we hope you are comfortable because you are about to enter a tough class with brutal teaching methods, but luckily you will only be an observer. Mike Tyson vs. Donnie Long Donnie Long is the first unfortunate boxer to appear on the list of conceited fighters whom the great Iron Mike taught a lesson in the harshest way. Long had a short stint in the discipline, active from 81 to 87, and it was precisely his tough defeat against Mike Tyson that caused his professional career to crumble. On October 9, 85, in the ring of the Trump Casino Hotel in Atlantic City, New Jersey, Long had to face his fate and fight against the young knockout machine, Mike Tyson, in a scheduled six-round bout. That night, Tyson entered the ring with an undefeated record of eight victories by knockout while Long held a record of 15 victories, 10 of them by knockout and three defeats. It was then that Frank Cappuccino, without even starting the count, declared Tyson the winner by technical knockout at 1 minute and 28 seconds of the first round. Mike Tyson vs. Buster Mathis Jr. Another conceited fighter who had a short stint in the discipline and it was precisely his defeat against the great Iron Mike that would initiate his decline. Is Buster Mathis Jr. his period of activity in professional boxing was from 91 to 96 with a clean record of victories until he crossed paths with Tyson. Before his fight against Tyson, Mathis Jr. had an undefeated record of 20 victories, 16 of them by knockout, giving him enough confidence to act despicably towards the young legend. Boasting about everything he would do once they stepped into the ring. The night arrived, and on December 16, 95, Mathis Jr. had to prove that his skills inside the ring matched his bold words. Far from true, Tyson entered the ring at the core state spectrum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to show the conceited fighter what a good boxing demonstration was, setting the pace of the fight from the first moment and submitting him without mercy. We'll see what happens when he gets hit, though. Ronnie punches, there's a shot. And he has done a nice job of slip doing a good job slipping. Tyson missing again with the left hook. Mathis Jr. tried to resist standing for as long as possible, but he ended up being knocked down during the third round without showing signs of life, while Frank Cappuccino counted for his safety. That right footed pivot, swing around on your opponent's side, and cry. Buster's career seemed to be on track after winning his next fight by knockout against Ken Smith. However, one fight away, there was a knockout defeat orchestrated by Lou Savarese that would lead him to reconsider his abilities for the discipline and retire definitively from the fighting rings. Mike Tyson vs. Tony Tubbs After a tough defeat, some boxers can be seen rectifying their arrogance and sending a different message to the audience, showing respect for the fight that has taken place and, especially, for their opponent. However, this was not the case for Tony Tubbs. Although his professional record did not categorize him as a deficient fighter with 24 victories, 15 of them by knockout and only one defeat, there was no comparison with the already established champion Iron Mike, who remained undefeated with 33 victories, 29 of them by knockout. On March 21, 88, Tyson had to enter the ring to stop the threat that Tubbs represented to his heavyweight titles from the World Boxing Council, the World Boxing Association, and the International Boxing Federation. Despite Tubbs seeing himself as a formidable challenger to the beast's reign, nothing could prepare him for what he experienced that night in the ring of the Tokyo Dome in Japan. Tyson's warrior spirit activated as soon as the opening bell rang, and everything seemed to be going well for Tubbs, who managed to offer good exchanges, mitigating Tyson's offense with jabs and quick combinations. But for a big man, he's got fast hands. It's just a question now whether... Is this a strong chin that we talk about? And Bone Crusher Smith have stayed the course. It's obviously Tubbs planned him. He's going to try and do a bit of uh, outsmarting. I mean, that is. By the second round, Tubbs's courage had run out. He was hit by a daring left hook that landed smoothly on his right eye, making his whole body tremble. <laughs> right through Tyson's guard, that one. Tubbs ended up falling lifeless on the canvas, where he received the count by Arthur Mercant as his blood stained the peaceful light blue of the ring. 
He's getting shot. His body's broken up on him, Jim. And it's just as well he missed him with that one. After the fight, far from showing respect to the champion who managed to retain his titles, Tony claimed that it had been a stroke of luck. Mike Tyson vs. Tyrell Biggs The story of the conflict between Mike Tyson and Tyrell Biggs goes back years before they met in a professional boxing ring. Tyson's biggest dream in his youth was to represent his country in the Olympics and win a gold medal, but due to his short stature, the selection decided not to trust his abilities. Heartbroken, Tyson approached the group he aspired to belong to at the airport to wish them a safe journey, and Tyrell took the opportunity to humiliate him with a joke that seemed to come out of nowhere, emphasizing that he could not experience what they were about to. Since then, the rivalry between Biggs and Tyson only increased as Tyrell claimed that he knew the already champion better than anyone and that he wasn't as tough as he appeared. On October 16, 87, in the ring of the Convention Hall in Atlantic City, New Jersey, Destiny would call them both to iron out their differences and finally determine which of them was the best in the eyes of thousands of present spectators. Biggs was the threat to Tyson's heavyweight titles from the World Boxing Council, the World Boxing Association, and the International Boxing Federation, but he only managed to reach the seventh round of the 15 scheduled rounds for the event. It would be a left hook that made the arrogant Olympic medalist fly towards his corner where his body hit the canvas with his feet in the air. Oh, that was a tremendous left hand. Mike Tyson versus Frank Bruno. The logistics of the first encounter between Mike Tyson and Frank Bruno could easily be labeled as impossible as the champion's busy personal life continued to provide reasons to reschedule the fight. At one point, Bruno created rumors that Tyson was only running away from him, the new threat to the world heavyweight titles from the World Boxing Council, the World Boxing Association, the International Boxing Federation, and the ring magazine that Mike held. Finally, on February 25, 89, more than a year after the initially scheduled date for the match, Bruno had the opportunity to enter the ring at the Las Vegas Hilton in Nevada to face Tyson. But the result was not what he had waited for so long. Tyson attacked Bruno with the savagery of a beast that had waited locked in its cage for so long to pounce on its prey. Tyson finally went to the body in that last escape. Now Bruno lands the short. Bruno down after a right hand. After an explosive fight, he ended up defeating Bruno by technical knockout at 2 minutes and 55 seconds of the fifth round. Frank's arrogance would lead him to think that he had studied Tyson enough over the years to beat him in a rematch. On March 16, 96, now being the world heavyweight champion of the World Boxing Council, he entered the ring at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, Nevada, seeking to avenge his previous defeat and beat the great Iron Mike, who was believed to be past his prime. Tragically, Bruno ended up losing by technical knockout just 50 seconds into the third round, handing his eternal rival the title he had just obtained. Here's a combination uppercut by Tyson. Bruno expected. He said he's not looking for the Tyson. Or for Tyson, laying it on, pouring it on. Down goes Bruno into the ropes. Tyson was only defeated fairly by two opponents. Stay until the end not just to learn what happened in those fights, but also what was going on in Mike's personal life and why he agreed to step into the ring again only to end up surrendering. By the time of the fight, Tyson had already been inactive for 17 months. In fact, his last fight had been on February 22, 2003, when he knocked out his compatriot Clifford Etienne in Memphis in just 49 seconds. Many today point out that we were near the end of Tyson's career, but he wouldn't admit it. What his fans perhaps didn't know by then was that Tyson, the great monster, was backed into a corner. He had been forced to fight due to a dire financial situation. He had squandered a fortune of nearly $300 million, which was what he had earned throughout his career, and he knew he had to do something to avoid falling even deeper into the hole. What he didn't know was that after four rounds, he would sink even further. From the beginning, Danny Williams appeared confident. 
when he entered the ring, it seemed the audience was only on his side. However, when Tyson came out, the arena erupted. Tyson was 38, and Williams was 31. Although the age difference wasn't huge, Tyson knew he had to be cautious with his decisions in the ring. During the first round, both fighters were studying each other. Contrary to expectations, there were more clinches to buy time than well-connected punches. However, it seemed Tyson had a slight advantage given Williams' fighting style. Afraid, and that could be a huge mistake. The second round began similarly to how the first one ended. Tyson eventually managed to push Williams against the ropes and unleash a powerful combination of punches. But Danny's guard was perfectly positioned to leave no weak spots. Uh, Danny Williams told us he wants to take this fight to the fourth and fifth or sixth round, but the problem is if you take this much punishment. Tyson continued pressing forward while Danny kept going to Tyson's body to buy time. The night's results indicate that this was indeed Danny's strategy. The aggression escalated with one minute left in the second round when Danny, against the ropes, started counterattacking the punches Tyson was trying to land. Then he returned to his strategy of going after Tyson, allowing the seconds to pass, which ended the second round. Tyson ripping uppercuts to the chin. Now back comes Williams with a left-right combination. And that was the uppercut by Williams. He's ripping those shots. Pushing Tyson back. It's competitive now. At this point, Tyson still seemed to have the fight under control. He was always moving forward, working his way in with punches to corner Danny. However, due to Danny's guard, Tyson couldn't land any hooks. The third round began, and it seemed being against the ropes had become customary for Danny. With the difference now being that he would fight more actively against Tyson. With 2.30 left in the third round, the referee tried to separate them when Williams hit Tyson in the face. A move that would foreshadow the end of this fight. He is really right. making an impact. There's some blood. Gradually, the aggression between these two fighters increased as the seconds passed. Tyson, now with a cut over his left eyebrow, began to show signs of fatigue. In the fourth round, Tyson came out ready to give it his all. He tried to throw a right hook to Williams' face, but missed. Danny knew he had to do something before Tyson found the perfect opportunity to land one of his powerful punches. So, he took the initiative. Now it was he who pushed Tyson against the ropes. Big right hand, a straight right by Tyson, but it was out in the chest, and back comes Williams! In the final 30 seconds of this fourth round, Tyson's exhaustion was evident, and Williams, who had been fighting passively for most of the time, had enough energy to create an explosion. Danny started throwing a combination of punches that Tyson probably couldn't even see coming. He no longer held his fists up to his face, he was worn out, and letting his guard down did not work in his favor at all. With less than 15 seconds left in the round, Williams threw the hook that didn't send Tyson to the canvas solely because it was caught by the ropes. Here in round four. Big right hand by Danny The referee began the count, but Mike couldn't get up before it ended. It's over. Williams won, was heard, and the arena erupted. Williams had already said he would knock Tyson out in a few rounds, and he had kept his word. For him, the victory had opened the door to a world title fight. But for Tyson, it had perhaps been one of the bitterest moments of his career. Although this defeat wouldn't yet be the reason for his surrender. On June 11, 2005, the audience and the world witnessed what was called Tyson's surrender. His ride, 32 and Tyson, 38, set the perfect stage for a repeat of what happened with Danny Williams, a exhausted Tyson being knocked out. 
A strategy we had seen in some of his best fights before, but one Mike didn't seem to handle as well anymore. His team tried to encourage him, but Tyson surrendered. If seeing Tyson give up was devastating for his fans, hearing his punches hadn't only taken him to the top, his consciousness and honesty upon retiring had humanized him. The Beast had become a living legend. Do you think these last fights tarnished the legacy of the great Iron Mike? It is undeniable that the golden age of the baddest man on the planet was in the 1980s, as his peak was glorious. 1986 was a decisive year for young Mike Tyson. The talented young man confidently surpassed all the barriers that came his way. Iron Mike won nine fights, including bouts against strong opponents such as Jesse Ferguson James, Tillis Mitch Green, Marvis Frazier, and Jose Ribalta. The fight with Jamaican Trevor Burbick was just around the corner, but the 20-year-old phenomenon decided not to rest on his laurels. In September 1986, Mike crossed gloves with former world cruiserweight champion Alfonso Ratliff. He won the world heavyweight title twice in the 1980s and is the youngest boxer in history to win a world heavyweight title when he captured the WBC title from Trevor Burbick on November 22, 1986, at the age of only 20. He would unify all the titles against champions James Smith, WBA, and Tony Tucker, IBF. But Alfonso Ratliff began his boxing career in search of economic support, and although things didn't start off well, Ratliff found his true passion in boxing and managed to stand out among the best in history. As an amateur, Ratliff won the Chicago Golden Gloves title in 1980 and scored a decision victory over Mitch Green in an intercity competition. That same year, precisely on August 25th, Alfonso Ratliff made his first appearance on a professional boxing stage. Ratliff debuted as a professional at the age of 20 in 1980, and by that year, after his debut, he had built an excellent reputation as an amateur. For his debut, Ratliff faced relatively unknown opponent Jim Flynn, winning by KO in the first round in just 2 minutes and 11 seconds. His career was progressing, and he started having encounters with renowned and high-level boxers. After his first professional fight, with an ecstatic audience at the Bismarck Hotel in Chicago, Illinois, United States, Ratliff had showcased his talent, skill, and resilience, subsequently facing other opponents. After a year as a professional, he had already accumulated 13 victories, 10 of them by KO. But then came his first major challenge. It would be on May 12, 1981, when he faced boxer Tim Witherspoon, who had a similar winning streak to Alfonso Ratliff, with 12 consecutive victories, 11 of them by KO. However, this fight would mark Alfonso Ratliff's first defeat, and it was in the seventh round that Tim Witherspoon cornered him against the ropes, prompting the referee to stop the fight and declare a technical knockout. After this defeat, Alfonso Ratliff focused on seeking and obtaining the opportunity to reach the pinnacle of the boxing world. Following this defeat, Alfonso achieved six more victories and only one defeat. On June 6th, 1985, at the Riviera Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada, United States, he would compete for the WBC Junior Cruiserweight or Junior Heavyweight title against Puerto Rican Carlos de Leon. where Alfonso Ratliff would secure a victory after 12 grueling rounds. However, this WBC cruiserweight title wouldn't last long, as just two months later, Alfonso would have a showdown with Bernardo Benton for the title. On September 21, 1985, in Las Vegas, Nevada, the fight took place. 
Bernardo Benton would achieve victory after 12 rounds by a unanimous decision over Alfonso Radliff, who would lose the WBC and linear cruiserweight titles. On September 6, 1986, the epic fight between two titans of the ring, Mike Tyson and Alfonso Radliff, took place. This fight was one of the most anticipated of the decade. The stage was set at the Las Vegas Hilton in Winchester, Nevada, United States, for a night full of action and excitement. Both fighters came with impressive records, making this fight truly interesting. On one hand, there was Mike Tyson, a young and feared fighter at only 20 years old, with an undefeated record of 27 victories, all by knockout. On the other hand, Alfonso Radliff, an experienced 33-year-old boxer with a record of 17 victories, 3 defeats, and 1 draw. From the beginning, Tyson showcased his impressive power and speed, seeking to intimidate his opponent and knocking him down. However, Ratliff showed bravery and resilience by quickly getting up despite Tyson's fierce blows. And fire, fire back, throw some punches. Well, he threw a right hand there, but I'll tell you, he got out of there right after he threw it. Well, what happened? Mike's superiority was evident. Tyson continued to unleash a series of powerful punches that pushed Ratliff against the ropes on multiple occasions. Although Alfonso valiantly defended himself, he couldn't avoid Tyson's accurate strikes. At a critical moment in the fight, Tyson's formidable left hook successfully landed on Ratliff's chin, leaving him staggering. The crowd erupted in applause and amazed shouts at such ferocity. As the fight progressed, Tyson's momentum and confidence grew. Focused and energetic, he threw punches from every possible angle, relentlessly pursuing Ratliff. However, Ratliff counterattacked with a combination of quick and precise blows that left Tyson dazed. This brief exchange of punches ignited the crowd and took the excitement to its peak. What is doing here? Now, so far it's tracked me. There was a right hand by Tyson. By the second round, despite Ratliff's resistance, Tyson dominated the ring. His incredible ability to dodge Ratliff's punches and deliver devastating counterattacks was admirable. Tyson landed a powerful blow to Ratliff's jaw, sending him to the canvas. Alfonso got up just as the referee reached the count of nine, but his fatigue was evident and Tyson had control of the fight. Despite his resistance and effort to get up and continue the fight, Ratliff was knocked down by Tyson once again. And that should be just about it. Davy Pearl looking very closely. And that's all. It's over. The referee, seeing that Ratliff was in a deplorable state, decided to end the fight and declare Mike Tyson the winner by technical knockout. The fight between Mike Tyson and Alfonso Ratliff was an unforgettable event, a battle between two warriors who left their mark on the history of heavyweight boxing. Tyson once again demonstrated his strength and skill, while Ratliff showed his courage and determination, enduring the onslaught of a young and powerful boxer. The path to the top of boxing is not easy. Often, two rivals with similar profiles must face each other to determine who takes the next step and who lags behind. Within the boxing universe, Tyson is one of the brightest stars. However, there were those who doubted his potential in the early days, denying him the opportunity to fulfill one of his greatest dreams. This only served as motivation to ignite the fire that would burn down all the opponents he had to face after that moment, but there was one, in particular, that will always remain in Mike's memory, Tyrell Biggs. Watch until the end to find out why Tyson trained for years to defeat Tyrell and how it all played out when, after humiliations and taunts, they finally faced each other in the ring. From a young age, Tyson presented himself as a true beast in the ring. However, he rarely felt antipathy towards his opponents outside of it. 
No matter how tough the punishment he dished out to his adversaries during battles, when they ended, he extended his hand as a symbol of sympathy and respect for his fellow boxer. But there was one opponent he came to hate, one with whom he seized the opportunity to step into the ring and unleash all the anger he had been holding onto for years. Tyrell Biggs may hold the title of the only opponent Tyson truly despised, not for his boxing abilities or as a threat, but for his big mouth, which he used to humiliate Mike on more than one occasion. It all began when both were amateur boxers with qualities that set them apart from the rest, so it was no surprise when they both considered themselves for the U.S. Olympic team. The differences between Tyson and Biggs were mostly physical. Being taller and more robust, Tyrell gave the impression of being a tougher opponent to beat, However, the great Iron Mike, from the beginning, worked diligently to turn his physical limitations into his best attributes, allowing him to defeat Giants when it seemed like he was the underdog. The Olympic team failed to see the advantages a shorter fighter like Tyson could offer and chose to include Biggs among its members, robbing Iron Mike of any chance to win an Olympic medal. It was one of the toughest moments in Tyson's early career. His dreams of standing on the Olympic podium had been shattered, and he knew he wanted to prove that the great Tyrell Biggs was not his equal in the boxing ring. Tyrell stoked the flames of antipathy that had begun smoldering inside Tyson when, in 1984, he took the opportunity to mock him in front of the entire U.S. Olympic boxing team and other people in the room. Demonstrating the great humility that characterized Tyson, he approached to wish his potential teammates a safe journey, and Biggs couldn't keep his mouth shut, so he ended up saying, mockingly, that he didn't know who Tyson was, but he was clear he wouldn't be getting on the plane with them. The insult, which could have passed as a simple joke, sank deep into Tyson's mind and heart, and the desire to prove himself as good as Tyrell turned almost instantly into the desire for revenge against someone who had underestimated and publicly humiliated him. Jumping ahead in time, Tyson would have the opportunity to face his nemesis, Tyrell Biggs, on October 16, 1987. Once the fight was agreed upon, Tyrell seized the opportunity to fuel the excitement surrounding the contest and revive an old rivalry by making public statements where he continued to try to humiliate Tyson. However, the great Iron Mike knew he had to let his fists do the talking, and he didn't want to spoil the excitement of the audience by announcing how he would win. But even the noble heart of a noble warrior like Tyson couldn't help but harden due to the hatred he felt for a big talker like Tyrell Biggs, which he channeled to explode against him that night. Tyrell entered the ring undefeated, with a record of 15 wins, 10 of them by knockout. Fans and expert commentators considered him the ideal opponent for Iron Mike. Tyson entered the arena with his titles, like a true champion, sending a clear message to Biggs that if he wanted to beat him, he would have to be as good as his attempts to humiliate him. Tyson's record was twice that of Biggs, even though he was five years younger. Not only was Tyson also undefeated, but he had won 31 fights at that point, with 27 of them by knockout. Anyone who experienced defeat that night would remember their opponent as the man who ended their winning streak, fueling the mutual hatred between them. With the first bell, what many would call the event of the year began. But for Tyson and Biggs, it was the opportunity to finally prove who the better boxer was. Tyson came out of his corner with the aggression he was known for, while Biggs used his footwork to avoid the attacks Iron Mike had contained for years. Tyson didn't seem intimidated by the physical qualities that had favored Biggs when he was chosen for the Olympic team years ago, and he set the pace of the fight in the first round. He's trying for the head. Now we see him head. During the second round, Tyson, the beast, actively pursued his prey around the ring, seeking the opportunity to land punches to Biggs's head and upper body. Biggs couldn't evade forever, and with 30 seconds left in the round, he had to endure a significant combination of blows from the man who had said he lacked what it took to hurt him. Right hand does the most damage. There was a big right hand. Well, right, right, right. Now, Georgie Benjamin will say, keep those hands high. 
By the third round, Tyson's strategy was becoming clear. He was directing most of his attacks to Biggs's body to wear him down and seek a knockout victory in the later rounds. However, Biggs, an Olympic champion, seemed to have run out of ideas on how to handle an opponent of Iron Mike's stature and assumed a defensive posture. Pointed out before the fight. And now, it's Tyson just hammering. In the fourth and fifth rounds, Tyson made significant advances in his attempts to weaken Biggs, who, when feeling cornered, launched himself at Mike's body in an attempt to stop the punishment and create some distance between them. The quality of the occasional attacks Biggs launched was not comparable to the onslaught he was receiving from the opponent he had underestimated and mocked for years. Every jab or uppercut Tyson threw surely struck a blow to the ego of the Olympic champion, whose medal did not exempt him from receiving the fury of a true warrior. I'm, uh, Tyrell Biggs now. Start throw some uppercuts. He took a big left hand there. The physical wear and tear that Tyson had planned from the early rounds of the fight began to show on Biggs's body during the 6th and 7th rounds. By this point in the contest, one of them was actively seeking victory, while the other was trying to stay on his feet for as long as possible. Biggs entered the 7th round with a high risk of not completing it, and Tyson knew it. What neither could imagine was that Mike's intelligent strategy would materialize when, just over 30 seconds from the end of the round, he landed the punch that sent the great Tyrell Biggs falling backward onto the canvas. And he's never, there's a right hand that just caught Biggs. But he didn't put him away. The elbow there. Oh, that That was a tremendous left hand. Tyson, the smaller man in size, nearly knocked Biggs, the taller man, out of the ring. He was caught by the ropes, and the audience couldn't believe what they were witnessing. The entire arena was stunned by the incredible feat. Near the end of the count, Tyrell Biggs's pride forced him to get back up, and the referee confirmed that he was capable of continuing the battle. But he had run out of cards to play and in less than 10 seconds, due to a powerful combination of punches characteristic of the great Iron Mike, he was once again lying on the canvas. The referee immediately signaled that there was nothing to be done. With no count of safety, it became evident that the big talker Biggs was out of the fight and was not on Tyson's level. While Tyson was celebrated as a true champion, Biggs needed assistance to get back up and leave the ring, but his head hung low. Everyone acknowledged the great performance Mike had delivered from the first round, and everyone would remember this bout as the day Tyrell Biggs couldn't live up to his words. It's fair to say that of the many times Mike Tyson tasted victory, this could have been one of the times when he felt the sweetest. What started as a challenge, to beat the boxer who had been chosen before him to fulfill his dream of standing on the Olympic podium, later turned into a personal vendetta, materializing years later. It proved to everyone that Biggs's physical attributes meant nothing against Tyson and that his words didn't hurt him like the punches that had brought him down. Now that you know the story, do you think that the small stature of the great Iron Mike was really an advantage he used throughout his career, or was it his combat intelligence that always favored him in knowing when and where to attack his opponents? We'll be reading your comments.